come to show you the portable eye examination kit, which is a smartphone based uh, app, which we call Peak. And this allows us to perform a whole series of tests on the eye to determine how well somebody can see and, and also get image data of the eye. This is on a Android device. Um, so here's Peak. Okay, so, so it's just an app. It's that an app. You have. Okay. Two, two tests currently going on. One is in Kenya and mm -hmm. the other is on the South Pole. Fantastic. Um, so it's been tested on the South Pole and on the equator in Kenya where I am. Um, once you've created a patient record, uh, you've got a whole selection of tests that you can go into. Um, and so the normal one that we begin with is testing a person's vision. Um, so this What's is visual acuity? Is so visual acuity is the, the ophthalmologist's way of saying what can somebody see. So when you go to the optician and they show you the screen with all the different size letters on, that's basically exactly. doing the same thing. Exactly. Um, whereas this is a bit more intuitive than that test. And the problem with having a letter test is if you've got a group of people who are illiterate or can't read English letters, you then can't test the vision. And what you want to make sure you're testing is their vision, not their ability to read. Um, so the beauty of this test is it actually uses a letter E in several directions and I don't need to know whether you're recording the correct answer. So I would show you this letter E, and I'd ask you which way is the E point, the legs of the E pointing. Oh, I see. So it doesn't matter if they actually know what it represents. Yeah. So yeah. if you point to where you think the legs of the E point. Down. So all I would do to record your answer is swipe down. To the left. Up. Down. Left. Down. Right. If you yes. Oh, go. finished. That was, that was a lot quicker than going to the optician. So, because if, you, if you've got normal vision, it gets the result very quickly. And what we've developed is an algorithm where you don't spend too much time on people with good vision, but it spends more time on someone with poor vision. Uh, we can use it to take a picture of someone's lens for cataract, or we can put a clip-on device which allows us to, to look at the back of someone's eye to view the retina. That's amazing. Can, can, you, show me, can you show me one of, the, one of those? Um, so, if we go into cataract imaging, here. What I do is this then shines a bright light in your eyes, so I'll, I'll do that on you there. Bright light up to your eye, it gives me a zoomed okay. view. Don't have to look at it. Just straight ahead. Now what I would then do is zoom into the picture and wow. we see a carousel of images to compare against. And what we do is select the one that you're most similar to. Oh, I see. So it requires the user to, to, yeah. be, to actually make it be making the to, yeah, to, to have a go at what they think yeah. is missing. And what we're actually doing is comparing what they record the image as compared to this image sent to Moorfields Eye Hospital for them to grade, as well as me testing it on some expensive equipment out in the field. So we're comparing it all to the standards. Um, and then the other test that we, we do is then we take pictures of the back of the eye retina on the retina image. image. Right. So for this, we add a, an attachment um, which we can then hold up to your eye and it'll allow us to see into the back of your eye. And as well as logistics, what would you say the other real benefits are? You can put it in your pocket. Um, you can charge it on a solar panel. So our team carry a solar powered rucksack and it charges as they're, as they're traveling. Um, and it's just incredibly user friendly. It doesn't require much training at all. Um, and th those are the, the main advantages. And uh, what we hope is it'll provide a paradigm shift where no longer a patients who can't afford to come to the hospital not coming, but you've got effectively experts because they've got this device in the hand going to the front door of the patient. How much cheaper is this than the traditional methods? If you add in all the components and, and the logistics and the, the uh, vans you need to carry the equipment, you're talking up to 100 times cheaper doing this on the phone than standard equipment. I think one of the things that we have to safeguard is that we ensure everything we develop is validated properly and scientifically. Um, there's a lot of apps out there and you can easily get lost in the number of apps that haven't been proven to work. And so we don't want to just create a gimmick. We want to test something that not only works in the hands of the people that are going to do it, but we've got scientific evidence that it changes practice and it increases the access to, to eye care. And that's what we're trying to do in Kenya at the moment. And how do you do that test? How can you prove that it's as accurate as the systems it's replacing? So at the moment I'm traveling around examining these 5,000 people with all the hospital equipment and a team of 15 people. Those same individuals that have been examined by all that equipment are separately being examined by a technician using the phone. We can then compare the data of the two and say how accurate is the phone against all of that equipment led by such a big team. My interest is in paediatric acuity and I was involved in a project in Malawi um, 
they have one ophthalmologist specialising in paediatrics serving a massive population. And the attitude to checking a child's vision is in many ways like the attitude we have in the Western world to checking the vision of a dog or a cat. It's perceived as being so difficult. Why would you try? Why is it difficult? Well, a child doesn't talk to you in the same way an adult does. A child can't read a chart. A child doesn't understand they're being tested. A child doesn't like their eye being covered. If you can imagine checking the vision of a baby, where would you start? And the current techniques, very elegant techniques, are chart-based. You hold up very large charts that have a picture with a very fine outline, there are various techniques, on only one side of the chart, and the rest is a uniform grey. So a baby will instinctively look at the novelty. So you infer from the way the child's head moves whether the target is seen or whether it's not seen. And you reach the threshold where the child just looks blankly at the chart. It's beautiful. It works fantastically Very well. Simple. But they're in the order of 600 to 1,000 pounds for a collection of cards. But with the advent of these high-resolution displays, with the possibility of eye movement detection, and by turning it into a game with sound rewards, suddenly you've got an opportunity to do this in a completely new way. And because so many children see mobile phones as a source of recreation, they think they're playing a game. So, so it's something they, exciting for yeah, them. Yeah, the, the engagement is better. So, if I was to present this to you, and I might okay. demonstrate in the first instance how this game works, I would press this. Press the little square which is offset from yes. everything else. Okay. And you would be rewarded with that little animation. I can imagine kids love that. And so if I was to ask you, can you find Vern? That's the name of the Just character. about. Well done. So what is this testing? This is testing visual acuity. It's the same information that we're extracting as the tumbling E test, but in a way that a child can um, relate to. Let's have another go. This is quite fun for adults. Yeah. Well, have you thought about just rolling this out to you everybody? You need to try some more apps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting quite tricky, actually. It is. Yeah. And is this test as accurate as the test That's you have on adults? That's a very good question. It's probably not as accurate, but then no test for children's vision is. The question is, is it as good as what's out there already? And that's and a subject of my research. When will you know? Well, so far it's looking good. At the very least, this will detect poor vision in children, which instantly makes it of value in the third world. So I'm based with Andrew in Kenya so that I can see the, the challenges. Um, designing it for a UK hospital situation when we want it to be used in the field. What kind of challenges do you face when someone who's never really used a smartphone has to use the app? A lot of gestures and knowledge of how to manipulate an application that you, you often take for granted and think you always knew. Um, you don't, pe people don't know that swiping will do something or, or that you can move lists up and down. Even very basic things like that aren't, aren't always known, so you really have to guide people all, all the way through the experience. What's the potential for this app to be used directly by the patient? Yeah, so that's something we've talked about, and I think it varies based on tests, um, but it would certainly be possible for people without training if there was two of you to, to download it and, I mean, not look at the back of the eye, but for all of the other tests, sort of perform them on each other. Um, and even sort of crowdsourcing, if you're dealing with, you know, a very wide area and you want some basic information, all you need is one person in a village with a smartphone, which in our experience, even in Kenya, is usually the case. Uh, and they would be able to sort of run at least screening level tests on, on the village and send that data back. Globally, there's 285 million people who live with visual impairment, of whom 39 million of those are blind. How much of that blindness could actually have been prevented? Uh, approximately 80% of all blindness is either preventable or curable. So that's the majority. And so the thing is that 90% of people who are blind live in low in income countries. Um, so that's the vast majority are living in poverty and they, the two are very much connected, poverty and blindness. Um, and one of the ironic things we find is more people have access to a mobile phone than they do to clean running water.